and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a third round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol voice acting competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. If you'd like to hear more of this contestant, voting for them is simple and only takes a moment. Just click the thumbs up icon. Can't stand them? Then click the thumbs down icon instead and cast them into the digital nether realm from whence they came. You decide their fate. Good luck to all of our contestants. Army from the Knife Point Horror Series by Sauron Narnia. Narrated by Jason Hill for round three of the Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's Evil Idol competition. My name is Solomon Tall. On the twenty-seventh moon of the year of the Shining Cloud, I awoke in our encampment with a terrible feeling. For five days we'd been without motion in any direction, waiting waiting for the knights to give us the order to move east. But it hadn't come. And so our days had been spent sharpening our pikes and shaving our arrow points. And at night there were songs and stories, as we hoped and prayed a miracle would come for us. But that morning, which was gray and foggy, I sensed a stirring among the men, and one by one they woke up, and we could see fire on the horizon. And then they came, a thousand men marching and on horseback. And when I saw them come over the hill, I put my head in my hands, and I told myself that I was not certainly dead. I couldn't know this was the end. But every man in camp despaired, especially when we saw that more and more armies joined the first, until in the end there were thousands spread out around us and we had to move from Red Rael because there was no room in the fields for us at all. The armies carried themselves with dignity, but the fear was etched in their faces, even in the faces of the proud knights. Preparations were begun to march, orders were shouted, and we were aligned in columns. It took hours. All fires were crushed, the wagons were loaded with supplies, the tents struck down. Harrick, my only friend, who I now clung to for his bravery so I would not go mad, told me he guessed our journey overland would only be of a single day. This he said he could tell by the amount of supplies left behind for the wolves. One day. That meant we were all headed for the shore, and though we were not permitted to inquire about our destination, and no one was telling us anything, our fates were sealed. We started to move at midday, more than four thousand soldiers moving through the mud. The fog did not let up. Word came through the ranks that more than a dozen men had not moved from camp. They'd simply stayed and asked to be executed. Rumor held that their wishes had been quickly granted. Stieg, a pikeman, told me he had seen it happen. There had been humor even when marching toward the battle at the Cliffs of Shand. But now there was none, for not a single man believed he would live through what we were to face. The knights were excessively harsh when a man fell out of line or a wagon was slowed. They tolerated no speech that they could hear. They barked and shouted orders, and we followed them, our heads down. Toward the beginning of dusk I heard a man sobbing to my left, and I turned and I saw a young spearman who had broken down. Yet his step did not slow. And I saw a man who walked forward, even as his face had turned a sickly white, gazing forward with eyes as dead as any I had ever seen. It was as if he had accepted his fate so readily that he was willing himself to become a zombie. At night, when we expected to rest, we did not rest. Torches were lit, and we entered the Inchlid forest, we could see figures, human figures, watching us at a safe distance. These were the woods people, but they may as well have been the angels of death. Later I would see a man and a woman standing close enough that I could make out their faces by the light of a torch. 
They had faces like stone idols, without emotion or sympathy. There was no food for us. We walked all night through the cold. What did the knights care, after all, if we starved? I heard men fall, but I didn't look back. By dawn of the next day, I was almost delirious with exhaustion. Just as light came, the order came down for us to slow our movement. We had broken through the woods an hour before, and a quarter of an hour after that, the night suddenly galloped ahead, and we saw the sea. Eight great warships waited for us. We ceased movement and then began the process of loading the armies onto them. It was more waiting, but now at least we were allowed to rest, and soup came down the lines, and bread. Not much, just enough to keep us conscious. The knights sent guards through with assignments, and the armies began to separate from each other. There would be no sleep on board, we were told. More than anything, I did not want to be separated from Herrick. I stayed close to him. He cursed the disorganization of the knights under his breath. But there was something wrong with him. He clutched his stomach close as he spoke. It took more than two hours of interminable shuffling and shifting to get us onto the boats. It was far, far colder than it had been the day before. The knights didn't even care about the low murmur that went through the armies. We could see when we got close to them that even though they had been on horseback, and not nearly as punished physically, they too were red-eyed and frightened. We moved inch by inch across the gangplank, sometimes stopping and I was less than twenty yards from the mouth of the gateway when something thudded beside me. I looked down, and a man had collapsed almost at my feet. It was Herrick. I reached down, and so did the man beside me. Herrick's face was locked in a scream, but no sound emerged. He lay on his side, not moving. A guard came through and hovered over him and then pushed me out of the way as I shook Herrick desperately. He's died, the guard said very softly. He's died. It hadn't been an ordinary death. His face told us so. It had been fear. The guard and one of the knights stayed with Herrick while urging us to move. It was Stieg the pikeman who kept me from collapsing myself, pushing me on. He and I both wept then. We were no longer ashamed, and we weren't the only ones. I looked back and saw Herrick being carried back to shore, and he disappeared from my view, blotted out by the throng of soldiers all around me. On the ship I lay sprawled across the wooden supports, able to sleep out only fitfully. More meaningless hours went by as we waited for the boat to leave shore. It would be the last time we would ever touch our homeland. The men took their places and we were left alone, the knights and guards collecting up on the deck to begin their planning. This would be no mere attack. It would be a full-scale invasion. There were no more warships to come. Every available man had been called to fight this enemy. Without our overseers watching, there was more talk and counsel delivered to the weakest of us, even as most pass out from exhaustion. I remained almost silent. There was more stirring when the cooks came through with more soup, and even meat, and sugared tea. That night, I sometimes heard a splash, which I would learn at dawn had been the sound of men throwing themselves from the brig. The freezing water represented a most merciful death. I was aware of four of these suicides. These men were unobstructed in their goal. I saw in the middle of the night a long swordsman of my acquaintance staring silently through one of the portholes, and I made my way over to him, desperate for human contact, even if it was utterly wordless. He and I exchanged a glance, and nothing more. Our ship was on the far left of the formation of the fleet, and all I could see at first was the open ocean. Within minutes, though, I saw a shape out there on the water, a vessel sailing in the opposite direction toward Red Rael. It was a great carrack. The long swordsman 
seeing it in real detail before I could, invoked the gods in a bloodless whisper. For there was no one on that ship. It drifted without aim across the water, pushed off from somewhere miles and miles away. And our own boat was turning away from it, toward the north, in an effort to avoid striking it. It passed close enough that we could hear the creaking of its masts. This invaluable vessel had no crew, no captain, no armies. They had been left on Alberiag to die, and none would return. It transported not even the bodies of the dead. Shortly after the sun rose, I saw that its color was not as it should have been. There was a faint yellow tinge in the sky, and upon seeing this, one of the Calic soldiers began to wail and cry out for the gods to sink our ship in mercy. The rest of us, almost to a man, lapsed into a hypnotized silence as we watched the yellow color become more and more intense until we were sailing into a surreal blanket of warm gold, a thick fog of color that drenched every ship. To hold one's hand in front of one's face was to see it lightly bathed in that sickening hue that we had only heard rumor about. Some began to speak of mutiny and desertion, of seizing control of the ship. But soon enough the guards came down from above, and Sir Roderick then appeared in the hold. And the first thing he said to us was, We are landing on Alberiag. He went on to say that we could, if we wished, write to our loved ones, and our messages would be held on board the ship for its return trip to Red Rael. Two guards began to pass out parchment and ink. Sir Roderick began to instruct us then, explaining in the driest terms the procedures we were to follow upon disembarking, procedures that we had to follow to the absolute letter in order to save mere seconds. It would be only a march of two miles to our attack point. The ship would touch the shore of Alberiag in less than six hours. He spoke further of divisional assignments and said there would be no rear guard and no man left on the beach. For four of those six hours, the idiot cleric Christide led us in a mass that he pushed ever onward, his voice becoming hoarse, having to stop for water dozens of times as he spoke every word he could from the Book of the Star. Finally, he could simply speak no more. For the last two hours before we landed, men lay on their planks, staring at the ceiling above them. Or they paced back and forth, muttering to themselves, or sat with head in hands, or like me, prayed. The sky above the sea was drenched in a thick amber glow as if the sun had caught fire and was dying. Sometimes the sky would seem to flicker, as if lightning were trying to press through from another realm. Night and day had no meaning here, as since the summer of the previous year that sky had remained constant over Albariag through every hour. Sixty minutes out from shore, we began to hear a sound we'd never known existed. There had been no tales of it. One had to listen close in the beginning to hear it over the waves. It was the sound of a thousand, perhaps ten thousand creatures. Not humans, more like animals, baying animals, who had congregated and were now emitting a common cry of excitement and rage. It rose slowly around us, and by the time land came into view to the north, every man was hearing it, and every man, including Sir Roderick, had gone quiet. Listening to this awful cacophony, which was constant and unyielding, we began to see through the amber cloak the features of the undefended shore, which seemed so much like our own back home. Sir Roderick commanded us to begin to maneuver into the optimum position for swift disembarkation, which meant pressing against each other near the keel. Four lancers began to frantically ready the gangplank for opening. We wedged in so tight against each other that it was difficult to breathe. We had to hope that the steersman would not cause such an abrupt landing that the contact would crush the men in the first ranks. My breath came shorter and shorter as we heard the bottom of the boat scrape the shoals. And then we had landed. A messenger lad shouted out and the gangway began to lower, allowing that diseased light to flood in. 
Not a one hesitated to exit the hold that had held us captive, even though the sound of that cloud of dissenting angry voices became much louder when the cold air struck us. We lined up on the shore, having very little room to maneuver, shoved this way and that by the momentum of whichever soldier moved to one's left and right. The horses and the dogs and the weapons were offloaded from one of the ships with great speed. It was obvious to me that things were moving much more swiftly than had been planned. The knights must have sensed the new panic among us that the mysterious outcry was causing. I was handed a halberd and immediately urged to start to march. As for sticking to the formations described to us on the ship, this plan seemed to have been abandoned. We were to simply go forward as quickly as we could. The soldiers began to march. I knew no one anymore. The faces were all quite unfamiliar. We reached grass. A wide field was stretching away from us, but the grass was dead and withered. The tumult of buzzing voices was getting louder and louder, coming from just up ahead. Now a man on my left dropped his blade, and when he reached down for it, he stayed on his knees, and then curled on the cold ground, as if wishing to sleep. Like a little boy, no one stopped for him. Another man dropped to the ground, having lost his footing. He made a half-attempt to rise, but from the despair etched on his face, I knew he would not get up again. His eyes closed, and he collapsed right there, like a doll. The knights were shouting orders over the din to stop for nothing when we were engaged. The healers had all been issued weapons as well, so there would be no medicines or treatments for the fallen. On a certain call they abandoned their horses, leaping from them, and raised their blades, and at the top of the hill their shouts became full-throated red-faced cries, their sound utterly lost beneath that of the enemies. Now our visibility had been cut to just a few hundred yards with the intensity of the amber fog. Over the hill, just up ahead, was the fissure. A crack in the earth more than a mile wide with a mouth twenty feet high. Inside it, was utter darkness. Now, torches were rapidly lit all around, including my own, as a boy of no more than fourteen anointed my free hand with fire. I was out in front. I would be among the first hundred men in, even in front of the mercenary ranks. The cry was put forth to run, and the knights, the bravest among us, not hesitating from their duty to lead the charge, began to rush toward the fissure. I ran. The footing beneath me was firm. I could see, reflected off the roof of the fissure, a flicker of light. Then another, and another, and another. Which meant the enemy was emerging with their own burning torches. We entered that terrible pit as one rampaging, undisciplined mass. I cannot say where the divide truly was between earth and this hell. But as soon as my voice gave out, and my eardrums began to shake with the force of the enemy's echoing collective scream, a face appeared in the darkness. The face of a being that was not meant for even a single step outside the fissure. It had once been a man, or something's imagining of one. But there was no clothing on its body, and its bones were only half protected by human flesh. A skeletal beast it was, two feet taller than I, having no eyes, and an enormous skull that was hideously bovine. It had not hands but claws, a filthy sword gripped in one, a blazing torch gripped in the other, and its jaws opened and closed many times in a single second, like some machine come to life. And before I could even raise my own weapon to strike it, Satan's thousands upon thousands of like-bodied atrocities became visible far beyond this one, in the rank and fetid shadows, as their torches broke the darkness, and their counter-invasion began. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs-up or thumbs-down vote. By doing so, You'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team. 
At the close of voting on September 23rd, based on your votes, the top five contestants will progress to the fourth and final round to take place live on October 31st at our annual Halloween live stream event, based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 